Well, it's about uh, 6.15, 6.30 a.m. as I'm recording the class. Uh, this will be posted later today. Uh, as you know, on our YouTube channel, primarily, and then we share it to uh, two or three Facebook sites as well, all linked with uh, uh, our name. Uh, today we are concluding our study of the little epistle of 3 John. And, and what that really means is that we're concluding our study of the epistles of John because we've now gone through his first epistle, 2 John, and 3 John. Look what he says. You can tell that he is concluding his epistle. I read as I studied for class that this is a typical, a normal closing of a letter in John's day, in John's culture. Let's see what he says. And again, verses 13 and 14. I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee. But I trust I shall shortly see thee and we shall speak face to face. And then the absolute closing greeting, peace be unto thee, peace be unto thee, our friends salute thee. So typical for letter writing, as I said, in the time in which John lived, but so non-typical of a New Testament letter, this word friends, we'll talk about it. Our friends salute thee. Greet the friends by name. Wow. That is what you say, preacher, I, I don't see much in that. It is a significant closing to a letter. Someone said, someone said, yes, it's typical, but it is not, it, it is not um, unsubstantial. It is typical, but it carries a load of spiritual meaning, spiritual illustration uh, for us if we will glean from its truths from its words. Uh, let's do the vocabulary. That's what we customarily do. I had many things to write. Uh, we know it's a short epistle. Technically, it's the shortest epistle in the New Testament, Third John. But even as he closes, he says, I had many things to write. The Greek text, I, I, I'm looking at it, pala, pala. Uh, it begins with uh, the word that is translated many things, many things. In Greek sentence structure class, the first word in a sentence carries heavy significance. The first word or two in a sentence are to be are to be strongly emphasized. Many things, many things. John has in his mind many other things he wants to discuss, but but it would not be it would not be as efficient to write them in a letter. We're going to learn in a minute. We did when I read the text. He wants to go and see these believers. He wants to explain some things in person. Emphasis, many things. I had many things to write. I had many things to write. And that is our old friend, Grapho. G-R-A-P-H-O, Grapho. It, uh, it simply means to pick up a pen in their day, they would use a stylus 
They could use any pointed, uh, uh, you could use the feather of, of a bird, the feather of a fowl, like a turkey, and uh, uh, the, the nib, the end of that feather could become a pen. You would dip it in your ink and write. I have many things to write. My goodness, that verb to write, it is an infinitive to write. Anytime you've got to linked immediately to a verb to write, to travel, to eat, whatever, uh, that's called an infinitive. It is a verbal, and, uh, and then it's in the present tense. It's like John is writing. I have many other things to say. My heart is burnt. Remember the church. Remember diatrophy situation. Past classes. Uh, do you remember uh, Demetrius? Uh, John's got an excited heart over Demetrius. He's got a hopeful heart when it comes to Gaius. But then again, he's got a heavy heart, a very heavy heart when it comes to uh, diatrophies. Let me say that again. I want to be sure. Uh, he's hopeful and excited and he's thrilled. He gives a good report of Demetrius. He is trusting the Lord that Gaius will accept his letter. Uh, he is very optimistic about that love, believeth all things, and agape love, hopeth all things. But then he's distressed, worried, burdened over the diatrophies situation. I had many, many things to write. But I will not with ink and pen write under the that word for ink is interesting and he he used the word back in second john as he closed his epistle there uh, it is a little greek word that means black b l a c k black it is only used ink it is only used three times in the entire new testament a black oily gummy sticky and yet lasting substance in which he would dip his stylus, his pen, and he's writing the letter. You can make the case that uh, some of the New Testament epistles were written by a secretary who would have sat by Paul as the Holy Ghost directed him in what to say, and that is accurate. That is, but I think with Third John, I don't believe there's a secretary. I don't believe anybody, I believe John himself. I am writing, I am writing. I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto you. I will not with ink and pen write unto you. And here we switch from a present tense, infinity to write, to an aorist tense. I will not uh, write unto you with pen and ink. And that means he knows when they receive the letter, when Gaius and that little church, when they receive the letter, John's writing will be past tense. He will have already complete. Greek is such a precise language, particularly in the area of the verbs. I had many, I guess I ought to show you your copy. I had many things to write. But I will not with ink and pen write unto thee. I communicate by text. Uh, just as an evangelist, many a revival meeting I booked by text. I like to do that because I text the exact date. The pastor receives the exact date. Uh, we've got a hard copy immediately. On the phone, you do not have a hard copy of the date upon which you agreed. Well, preacher, I don't see. But in a text, my wife constantly points this out to me. In a text, you can't tell voice tone. In a text, you can't detect excitement or dejection. But you sure can in personal, eye-to-eye -eye communication. And I think that's part of what John is saying. I can write a letter, but I'll be able to read you better and you'll be able to sense uh, my uh, earnestness better if we're face to face.
to face. And for that reason, I, got, I had many things to say. I, I, I will not with ink and pen write to thee. Uh, I, I just feel like it's wiser uh, to come and to speak to you in person. One day Jesus said this also, and John is a keen disciple of our Lord Jesus. Jesus said, I have many things to tell you. I had many things to say to you. But right now, you are not able to bear them. And the, the verb there for bear, you're not able to carry the load. You're, you would not be able to handle the, uh, the gravity of what I would say. Paul introduces to us the fact that uh, newborn babes, Peter agrees, they need the milk of the word. Peter even went so far, far as to say, as newborn babies, little infants, we should crave, we should desire the milk of the word. If you don't desire the milk of the word, you're probably not a newborn babe. You may not even be in the family of God. God's family has good, healthy appetite for the word. Jesus said, I can't tell you these things yet. Uh, you wouldn't be able to digest them. You wouldn't be, uh, they would worry you more than they would instruct you. You've got some growing to do, uh, disciples. He said that to his disciples. In like manner, John may be saying, I have many things to tell you. Many, many things to write. My fingers don't want to quit. The present tense, they just want to go on and on. Chapter two, chapter three, chapter four. Remember his gospel has 21 chapters. His Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, 22 chapters. Uh, I'd just like to go on and on and on, but no, no. I'll not communicate with pen and ink. I will not, I will not write with the, and the word there for pen, I guess a note on that would be helpful. 11 times, 11 times in our King James New Testament, that word is translated reed. That is a long stalk of vegetation that goes down by the marshlands, down by the sides of the rivers, and it's stiff, it's tough. They would take that reed and, and sharpen its point. It's a little bit porous. It would absorb a little bit of the ink and it becomes their, it becomes their pen with which they write. I think that's the vocabulary on verse 13. I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee. Write unto thee. And I'm just noticing something, class. And it is astounding. In my mind, I picture John writing to the whole little church of which Gaius is apparently the pastor, the under shepherd, the leader, but watch. We learned this rule a few lessons ago. I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee, thee. Class, that is not a plural pronoun. That is a singular in number, singular pronoun. He is writing simply to Gaius. This letter is addressed personally to him. Will the church read it? I suspect so. Will the church where Diotrephes attends, if, it's a big if, if he's in a different church than, uh, than Gaius, they may be in the same assembly Diotrephes may be trying to tell Gaius who he can accept and who he can't accept into the church fellowship. Remember, Diotrephes has got to be the boss. Got to have preeminence. I write unto thee. That is absolutely amazing. And we need to keep in mind the addressee, the addressee of the letter. Let's go a little bit further, can we? But I trust I shall shortly 
see thee, but I trust that I shall shortly see thee. The verb there for trust, elpizo, elpizo, E-L-P-I-Z-O, though you do hear the D sound when I pronounce it, elpizo, what does it mean, preacher? I hope to. I desire to. It is my plan to come there where you are and to shortly see thee. I shall shortly see thee. Wonder why the adverb shortly. And it means with haste. It, it means quickly. I think this is why. John wants to get there John wants to travel these miles and, and uh, uh, get face to face with Gaius because there's some problems brewing in the church. Uh, there are some difficulties that, that seem to be, excuse me, class. There are some difficulties that seem to be, I started to say just under the surface, but honestly, they're not under the surface anymore. They have bubbled up. They have boiled up to the top. Uh, what problems, preacher? Diotrophies. Right now, church growth in his area is at a standstill. He won't let any of John's missionaries come. He won't let any of John's uh, uh, teachers who are under John, as Elisha was under Elijah, as Timothy and Titus were under Paul, as it looks like John Mark was under Simon Peter's tutelage. Uh, and that situation has locked down evangelism, soul winning. That is locked down visiting. That's locked down uh, the possibility of revivals. John says, I've got to get there soon. All oh, what hinges on that little single verb shortly. I trust I shall shortly see thee. John loves Gaius. We learned in verse, one, uh, verse number one of our epistle, John called Gaius well beloved. Three other times, we're talking 14 verses, three other times, beloved, beloved, beloved. He loves him with all of his heart. And so for that reason, he trusts He's looking forward with joy and delight. I trust shortly to see you. I, I, I alluded to it a minute ago. It's in 1 Corinthians 13, the traits of agape love, real love, God's love. Uh, it uh, hopeth all things. I hope to see you. Real love hopeth all things, meaning it's optimistic. It's pleasant in its outlook. Uh, Gaius, I'm hoping you'll receive this letter. I'm hoping you'll further reject the, uh, the, the self-centeredness of diatrophies. I, I'm hoping you will uh, bring uh, uh, Demetrius into the fellowship and let him preach in the pulpit. And uh, I hope, I hope. Oh, I pray John wasn't disappointed in his old age. I trust it is the verb elpizo, hope. I trust I shall shortly see thee. I trust I shall shortly see thee. I want to say the word uh, there for see. I trust I shall shortly see thee. Horao, H-O-R-E, no, H-O-R-A-O, horao. It, it is a cognate of uh, Ido, E-I-D-O. It means to see you with perception, to see you with understanding, to see you so that I can mentally interpret, are you following my leadership or has diatrophies frightened you into hesitating uh, at uh, accepting me into the church when I come? And uh, that's the idea. Uh, I trust I shall shortly see you. 
not just look at you and measure your height again and your uh, your width and your weight and your body. No, no, no. I want to see you and feel your spirit. I want to see you and be sure you're still standing uh, with the truth. I believe you are, Gaius. And we shall speak face to face. And we shall speak face to face to face uh, that is a future verb we shall speak face to face I'm, I'm glancing at my great text I want to I want to be sure that that uh, uh, I have it down here laleo l a l e o that is the verb translated to speak now there is another Greek verb for speak Logeo, it comes from logos. Uh, the logos verb means to speak with logic, forethought, like the three points of a sermon, like the eight eight uh, 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 theorems for an argument for the empty tomb you're suggesting and preaching uh, in a play. But laleo, laleo. I don't think it carries quite that gravitas, though at times it looks like the verbs are interchangeable by the Holy Ghost. Laleo generally means this, generally means this, chit-chat. Now that's not, that's a cultural chit-chat, conversation, communion. John is as much as saying, no, it's not literally in my King James Bible, but he is as much as saying, Gaius, I'd like to sit down across a cup of coffee, maybe some hot tea, maybe whatever they had that they, some of your goat's milk, you're having, you're raising goats out back, and, and chit chat, converse, have a friendly conversation over these issues, over the fact that somebody's trying to run the church over the fact that you need some help. And I'm at Ephesus. I can't always come. I am coming for a brief visit, but I can't live there. I've got a ministry here. And uh, I'm sending uh, Demetrius and, and you're to receive him and love him and, and help him on the way after the revival there with you. That's the idea behind what John is saying. I'd like to speak to you face to face and just like he the wording that he used at the ending of second john speak to you face to face here's the greek stoma pros stoma i'm sure that's right but i'm looking at my greek text right here stoma pros stoma what does that mean literally translated stomach to stomach the Bible, I don't understand. I want to speak to you stomach to stomach. But our King James translators were wise enough, brilliant enough scholars. They didn't put it down stomach to stomach. How, how, how did they come up with face? My stomach opens up to a tube called my esophagus. My esophagus runs up to my throat. My throat yields out into my mouth, my tongue in my mouth, and so stoma becomes mouth. Or here, since the mouth is one of the central features of my countenance, of my face, stoma becomes face to face. I don't know that I can read you as well when I write you. I don't know your response, Gaius, so I shall shortly come and we shall sit and lovingly converse face to face. Now we know what John's immediate plans in the future are. We're beginning to pick up by placing these two verses in their setting. Class, the word is context. There's some pressing reasons for him to come. He's excited about some aspects of church life. He's discouraged about some other aspects of church. And I'm coming to see you. I'm coming so we can talk face to face. And technically now the letter is over. Technically now 
uh, third John is ended, but there is this matter of a proper closing. If we were writing an English letter, it would be yours truly or sincerely in Christ or until the sound of the trumpet or uh, uh, someone the other day pressing onward in Christ. Well, watch what John does. By now you probably memorized the text. I've held it up so often. I right hear peace be under thee. Peace be unto thee. You say, preacher, I, I don't understand that. Peace be unto thee. The word there for peace, I reign a. E-I-R-E-N-E. -E. We have studied this word before, haven't we, class? Peace be unto thee. Uh, let, let, let me glance. I think I'll be able to see it right off. Peace be unto thee. Thee there is written in the dative case. Peace be unto thee. It is a dative case, and that means peace to you and for you. Peace to you and for you. Now, let's talk about that word peace. I rene. Initially, fundamentally, basically, it comes from a Greek verb that means this, to join two things together. And the result is, right here, peace. Preacher, can you put that in more biblical context? Here's God, he's holy, he's perfect. Here's Mike Bagwell, he's a sinner, lost, undone, on his way to hell. We're far apart, all the way across the screen, we're far apart. But then one day God makes a move earthward, sends his son Jesus and he dies on the cross. God's not as far as he was. God's become one of us, the word was made flesh. And then God sends the Holy Ghost begins to woo me and love me and draw me, puts me under conviction and by grace through faith at the foot of the cross of Calvary where God came and bled, we are, we're no longer apart. We are now Iro. We're no longer enemies. We're no longer, we are now joined together as one. And there is peace. There was animosity. Somebody holler amen. There is peace and there is peace in the sense of salvation but now listen to me even as a christian though i've got that peace even as a christian if i sin if i falter if i err and don't confess it do not make it right with god do not cl get cleansed at the labor of god's forgiveness to being washed by water in the word of god I lose that peace. I do not lose my salvation. I do not lose my standing. I lose that peace. And all over again, if I'll confess my sins, Jesus had moved. He's at the cross. If I'll confess my sins, my separation from your sins have separated me from you, uh, from me, said God in the book of Isaiah. I'm drawn in and I get that peace. I get peace be unto you, Gaius. That can be peace objectively, the peace of God in my heart. That can be peace subjectively. Gaius, I pray that you, the subject, you in your church can solve this diatrophies, uh, uh, bossy, uh, rebellious spirit. I pray you'll grow, your church will magnify the Lord and grow numerically and in grace and knowledge of peace unto you peace the, the verb is supplied for clarity peace unto you let me tell you what that word peace is class it is the equivalent of the hebrew noun shalom shalom and when a jew says shalom he is wishing you well she is wishing you good health she is wishing that god's smile would rest upon you Peace to the Gentiles. That's the word they would use. Peace to the Greeks. Shalom to 
the Israelites. And since John is writing mostly, mostly Gentiles, he appropriately says, peace be unto thee. Honestly, class, that is tantamount to a prayer. I pray God's peace will be with you. Gaius, I pray that peace one to another in your little church fellowship will become more and more apparent, more and more powerful. Wow, peace be unto thee. And then John says, our friends salute thee. Our friends salute thee. As John is writing, there are gathered around him a few choice, close brethren in the Lord. Where did he learn that from Jesus? Uh, uh, John is a Jesus-made man. He learned it from Jesus. Jesus always had around him 12 disciples. We learned from uh, uh, Luke chapter 8, he always had around him some, some lady uh, disciples in, in a proper right sense. And uh, then we learned Jesus kept three close by Peter, James, and John. John says, I've got some friends like my Lord did, like he taught me. I've got some friends gathered around me. And our friends, our friends, let me show you the board again. Our friends, salute thee. The word salute there, it comes from S-P-A-O, spao, a Greek verb that means to draw your sword. To draw your sword out of its sheath. Uh, to, to draw your sword. But then it came to mean, and it's, uh, how is it here? Our friends salute thee. It came to literally mean a military salute watch me there's not a lot of difference between drawing your sword and drawing your hand in salute our friends salute them get a hold of this many many of those that john knows in ephesus possibly have never even met never even shaken hands with gaius and the little handful of believers that he lived. But though they may not know them personally, we send you greetings. Oh, let me try that with our class. Class, those of you that watch, watch in uh, Illinois, Indiana, by the way, we'll be with y'all in revival soon. Looking forward to it from the bottom of my heart, already excited, I salute you. Preacher, you're sitting uh, in a motel room near the Atlanta airport in Atlanta, Georgia, and you're salute. I salute you. I'm not with you. I can't see you. I don't know the circumstances under which you're uh, watching class today, but I salute you. There, there are individuals who watch our classes from overseas. I've never met you. I don't know, but I salute you. Oh, there ought to be that camaraderie. There ought to be that brotherly love among the members of God. So the people with John send their salutations to the people who are with Gaius. Our friends salute thee. And let me say that the word is philos, P-H-I-L-O-S. It is a word often used for love in the New Testament. Those that love me in Christ and I love them in Christ they're saluting. They want you to know they love you in our friends, our friends. And then watch this last line. Greet the friends by name. John says, now I know some people who are there. They were with us and they've come to help you and they uh, they moved maybe that direction. And uh, would you please, Gaius, and this is important, greet that's an imperative verb. It's only the second command in 3 John. Greet the friends by name. Would you go around your church and would you say to them by name, hello, God's best. May the smile of God be upon from uh, John the elder and the Christian friends who are with us. Greet them by name. Don't just, the preacher, I thought you said he was writing to Gaius personally. The grammar says he is. 
but now he's broadened it. And he said, Gaius, greet the whole church. Greet the friends by name. Not, not uh, oh, John over yonder says, tell y'all hello by name. Brother Thomas, hello. Uh, uh, Brother uh, uh, James, hello. Brother Jacob, hello. Sister Priscilla, hello. Sister Rebecca, hello. A beautiful closing to this epistle. And John does not pick up his, uh, his pencil, his pen again, until he's been imprisoned by the Roman government, banished to the Isle of Patmos, where he writes the great 22-chapter book of Revelation, his Apocalypse, it's actually the unveiling of the Lord Jesus showing us things to come. And oh my, oh my, that's John's magnum opus, his greatest work. That's his grand finale. But third John's not bad, hallelujah. Third John's not bad either. And in, in closing, and I have to close, no church is perfect. The Diotrephes thing sure wasn't. The Gaius church is not perfect. John's a little worried. He wants Gaius to stand true. Uh, but uh, though no church is perfect, it works. It functions. She's alive for God. And he's coming back to get us one day and present us as a glorious church. Hallelujah. Without spot or without wrinkle. And then I have to ask this. I've got to close our meditation, but I've got to ask this. Was this letter received? Did Gaius accept it, listen to it, act upon it? Did they end up disciplining diatrophies and saying you can't have the you can't be boss among the church? The Lord's the head of the church, not you. And did they accept the truth? And did they help the traveling missionaries go? Uh, the text itself does not say, but listen to Brother Bagwell. My answer to that question, yes, yes, a hundred times yes. I believe that Gaius said, John's coming. I'll get, I'll get everything in order. I'll get his bedroom ready. I'm going to get some extra food he can enjoy. He doesn't eat much, and, and he doesn't take care of himself. And uh, I, I'm going to rebuke, uh, but... but John's already told us, when I get there, I'll take care of diatrophies. When I get there, I'll set that thing straight. I'm going to get it ready so John can come short. I believe the answer is yes. Gaius loves and receives the elder, receives John. I believe he receives Di, uh, Demetrius. I believe he puts Demetrius. I believe it all works out. Preacher, why? You can't say that. On what authority? By, by what, uh, on what grounds do you believe that? I'll tell you why. Because 3 John ended up being in our Bible. I believe it had been a story of defeat. I believe if it had been a story of shame. I, I believe if it had been a story that puts a blot on the record, I don't believe the Holy Ghost, I think. Let me close this way. John, I believe, goes to Gaius. They do sit around that table drinking coffee there is sweet fellowship. They declared their mutual love for the truth. They do uh, let uh, Demetrius preach. They do have a church meeting and, and tell Diotrephes he's got to straighten up or he's going to be voted. I believe it all happens to the honor and the glory of God. Here's how I'll end. And they lived happily. <laughs> and they lived happily ever after. John... Gaius, Demetrius, maybe Diotrephes repented and got it straight. I'm not sure. You say, preacher, you can't say they lived happily ever. I can. Now they're in heaven. Now they're at the right hand of the Father. Now they're with Jesus Christ at his feet. And he's at the right hand. Oh, yes. And they lived happily ever after. Oh, oh, I didn't tell you. I want us next to go to an Old Testament book. I believe in next class, we're going to an Old Testament prophet, an Old Testament minor prophet. Are y'all getting excited? I am. And his name is Amos. We're going to study the chapters of Amos, one of the boldest preachers in the Bible. Join us. Join us next class 
Amos chapter 1, verse number 1.